introduction or transitioning from C to Java. And so now we're actually going to start um, using the object-oriented part of the Java language. Right, and so to begin, we're going to start with the, uh, I guess it's one of the more common classes uh, that you would see in Java. So it's the class called string. Before we get there, I'm going to talk a little bit about car, um, because strings are made up of cars in uh, Java. Right, so a string literal is just a sequence of characters. Right, each individual character is called a car, little c car. Right, so here you've got uh, a reference type, so string, right, but the elements... Uh, that are managed by a string are all of primitive type, right? So the elements of the string are actually these characters C, right? You might imagine that it's uh, simil uh, a Java string is similar to a C style string, right? So internally, there may be some array that holds the characters of the string, but you don't know that for sure. And in fact, the Java string class is uh, quite a bit more complicated than that. Um, the exact details, not really important for today's lecture. Right. So there's a string s, right, or a variable s. It refers to the string rub -a dub dub right. If you want to get an individual character from the string, right, you can ask the string s, or the, you can ask the variable s for its character at index 0. Right. So it's a zero indexed sequence of characters. Right. Notice the uh, notation that's used here. Right. So in C, if you wanted to get the first element of the car, uh, sorry, of the string, Right? You would uh, use square brackets and access it that way. Right? If you wanted to do something with the string, like um, print it, not print, well, print, I, no, not print it. If you wanted to do something like um, concatenate two strings or copy a string to another string, right, you would call some function and pass in the string object. Right? So one of the things you have to get used to in, uh, when using an object-oriented programming language is that often what you end up doing is you end up asking a variable, right, that refers to an object to do something, right, and so the syntax here is always variable name dot, and then the name of the method uh, that's associated with the object. Right. Okay, so car literals, uh, they are just like in C, they're delimited by single quotes, right, uh, there's exa always exactly one character inside the quotes, right, there's, so there's no such thing as the empty car. <coughs> Right? You can't put two cars side by side inside a car literal. Right? So it's always single quote, then one character, then closing single quote. Right? You can have a space as a character, but you cannot have no character. Right? So uh, there's no way to represent no character in uh, Java or C. Right? You can't use null either with primitive types. Right? So you, null only applies to reference types. So cars in both languages are actually integers of some kind. Right. Um, typically in both, well, in Java for sure, uh, car, the range of car is smaller than the range of int. That's normally true in C, but not always. Right. Um, so the mapping from the number that the car is to the character that it represents, um, in C, it's, uh, uni it's the standard is called Unicode, uh, and it's one of the versions of Unicode. Right. And so Unicode is a standard that was created uh, to the idea is that we should be able to represent all printable human characters, right, or symbols, right? And so um, there's like 65,536. That's the number of different characters that you can store in car. Right? Uh, so underneath the hood, they are just numbers. So you can store an integer value in a car, right, as long as it's inside this range, right, from 0 to 65,535. Right? And so uh, what happens, though, when you print the character, Right, is that um, internally Java maps the character onto a printable symbol and then it prints the symbol. Right? Now it's just a number, right? it's just an integer, so you can do arithmetic with the values, but the arithmetic is weird with car. So for example, I can take C right, and I can add 25 to it. Right? 65 turns out to be the uppercase A. If you add 25 to it, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, you end up with the uppercase Z. Right? And so if you run that in Eclipse, um, car examples, right? So up here, start out with A, print it out. Well, uh, yeah, I'm going to start out with A explicitly here. Uh, now I'm going to add 25 to it, and you'll see that when you print it out the second time, you get Z. Right? And if you run that down here, right, you get A and Z. Right? So you can do arithmetic with car, but it is strange. 
uh, because of the rules that Java uses uh, for int arithmetic, uh, for car arithmetic, sorry. Right? So the results are very unintuitive. You have to be very careful if you are in a situation trying to do something like this because the rules are somewhat confusing. So I can start out with A, and I can use plus plus or minus minus. Right? You can use the pre-increment operator version as well. Right? So plus plus C, minus minus C also works. Right? And that, uh, in this particular case, adds 1 to C. So that gives you B. Right? You can use the plus equal and the minus equal, multiply equals, divide equal operators. Right? They all work. Uh, they all work the way you expect them to. Right? And so again, C plus equals 1 adds 1 to C. Right? And C minus equals 1 subtracts 1 from C. Right? So we start out A, you end up at B, you end up uh, capital C, and now we end up back at uppercase B. Now the weird thing is these three work, uh, but this one doesn't. So when you try to add 1 to C, that doesn't work. Right? And uh, if you just pop into Eclipse and ask Eclipse, is this true? Right? So I'm going to uncomment this block. Right? And you can see right there, right? Eclipse complains. Right? You hover over it and it says, uh, type mismatch cannot convert from int to car. Right? And so if you go back and look at that expression, right, you ask, well, what the heck's going on here? Well, that's a car and that's an int. Right? So in Java, ints are wider than cars. So when you have mixed type arithmetic, you always convert the uh, smaller type to the wider type. So the car gets converted to int. Right? So that gets converted to, what are we at, 65, 66? Right. Is that right? 60, 65, 66, 67, 66. So 66, right? And then you add one that's 67, so that's an int, right? You can't store an int in a car because int is wider than car, and so now you get an error, right? So a solution to this particular problem, if you're going to write it this way, so number one, don't write it that way, right? Use plus equals or plus plus instead, uh, or if you have to, cast the entire, now notice I'm going to try cast here, right? I can't just cast the C, because C is already a car, right? And so the way the cast operator works is it converts the thing on the right-hand side. I need to convert the entire sum, so I have to put the entire sum inside of brackets like that. Right, and now Eclipse is happy with that. Right, it gets more confusing though, so this is when you add an int to a car, right? If I make a car D, right, and C is also a car, Right? And I try to add those together, you say, well, that ought to work, right? I'm adding a car and a car. That should fit, that should work. Uh, and again, right, if you go back to Eclipse, Eclipse complains. Right? And it says type mismatch cannot convert from int to car again. Right? And so what's going on here uh, is that uh, any arithmetic that you do with an integer type that's smaller than int, everything automatically gets converted to int. You don't have to remember that. I'm not going to ask you about that, right? But that's the way the Java language works, right? It says any, uh, so the smallest type that you can do arithmetic with for the integer types is always int. If you try to do arithmetic with a type that's smaller than int, it gets converted to int. So that gets converted to int, that gets converted to int. The sum is an int, can't store an int in a car, right? Why it works that way in Java, I don't actually know, um, but that is the way it works, right? And if you read the standard, it actually spells it out. That this is the way it works in Java, right? And so um, all, arithmetic, all int arithmetic in Java um, is always done uh, with a minimum with int, right? If you use long, then it's done using long. But if you do anything with short or byte or car, it ends up being done in int. So you run into the same problem again if you try to do this in short or byte, right? Okay, so arithmetic with car is uncommon, but it is occasionally useful if you need to programmatically generate a string. Right, and so, uh, for example, you can generate all pairs of two-letter uppercase strings, right? So A, 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 B, A, C, all the way through Z, Z, right? You just, you write two nested loops, right? And then you just treat the uh, letters like they were ints, right? So starting at A, going up to but not including the uppercase Z, right? Starting at A, going up to and including the uppercase Z, right? Just join them together, right? Now, notice when I join them together, I have to be a little bit careful how I do this too, right? If I just wrote C plus D, that's car plus car, which is int plus int, which is an int, right? So here I have to tell, again, it's another problem where I have to tell the compiler, hey, I really want to do string concatenation. So I have to start out with the empty string, right? Then concatenate 
whatever the C is to the string and then concatenate whatever D is to the string. Right? And then when you print that out, everything's fine. Uh, so let me, I'm gonna, whoops, sorry. I'm gonna comment out this block again because I don't need it anymore. And we'll look at the loop. Right, and now if you run that loop there, right, you can see here you end up with the, uh, well, uh, I'm not gonna show you all of them, but you end up with all, um, all two letter strings. Right? And if you strike off, right, and if you forget that, uh, oh, actually you get a, the compiler actually tells you that there's a problem here. Right? So if you just do C plus D, right, the compiler is actually useful in this particular case. Right? It's telling you I can't convert an int to a string. So that's good. Right? Now if you try to fix this by putting the string at the end, that'll make the compiler happy, um, but it'll give you the wrong result. Right? So if you do that and run that, you'll get something strange, right? Now you get all numbers, right? You say, well, what the heck's going on here, right? So you, when you read that expression there, right? Java sees it's all, the, all your operators are the plus operators, right? They're sum operators, right? And so Java says, well, they all have the same precedence, so I'm gonna go left to right, right? What's C plus D? Well, that's a car plus a car, so that's int plus int, and that gives you an int, right? Now it's int plus a string, so that's now string concatenation, right? And so now you get the string concatenated with the empty, uh, with the empty string, right? And that's why you get uh, the numbers like 170 being printed out here, right? So when you're doing this sort of thing, you have to be a little bit careful about where uh, you put, in this case, the empty string, right? But if you remember the lab, I also did this with long. So you have to remember that if you're gonna play this trick, the type that you want to convert to normally comes first. Right, so here I want to make sure it's a string, so I'm going to put the empty string first. Right, if I wanted to compute that sum in long arithmetic, I make sure 0L goes first. Right. And that's all because of this rule that Java goes left to right. Um, so to see uh, if you have an expression involving operators all having the same precedence. All right, so now we want to talk about strings. So I need to tell you about uh, types, classes, and objects. So whether or not someone told you this in the past, um, I'm gonna tell you what a type is, right? So a type is a set of values and the operations that can be done with those values, right? So int, uh, the set of values of int are all of the integers from the smallest int that it can represent to the largest int that you can represent, right? The operations that you can do with int, well, those are like uh, arithmetic comparisons and a few other uh, operations as well, right? And so int is a type. A class is just a reference type in Java, right? Int, double, boolean, those are all primitive types, right? Classes are reference types in Java, right? In particular, classes are user-defined reference types. So if you want to make your own type, you make a class, right? There's no way for you to make your own primitive type, right? Objects are just instances of the class, right? So the number four is an instance of an int, right? 3.5 is an instance of a double, Right, the string, H-E-L-L-O, would be an instance of a string, right, or an object, in this case, right? So when you're, talking about uh, when you're talking about classes, the instances are normally called objects, although you will, a lot of people just do, the, uh, do call them instances as well, right? So object, instance, means the same thing. So the string class is a type, right? It's a reference type that represents a sequence of characters. Right, so by sequence, I mean uh, that they're in some order, right? So, and that you can access the elements of the sequence using an index. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Right, they're very widely used in Java programs, and so because they're so widely used, the designers of the language um, made them look like, uh, made strings look like a primitive type, right? So you can do things like add two strings together, right? Uh, you can create a string uh, without using this uh, operator called new, which I'll explain in a second, right? And you can't do that with any other, uh, any other reference type in Java, right? You also have string literals, so anything inside double quotes is a string literal, right? There are no other literals uh, for any other reference type in the language. You can't make them either, right? So there's no way for you to define a literal for your type. Um, the plus operator exists for strings, Right? but no other arithmetic um, or comparison operators are defined for any other reference type. Uh, so it's a bit 
it's actually a little bit awkward introducing string as your first type because they don't really, sorry, as your first object type, uh, class type, reference type, because they don't really behave like other reference types. If you want the documentation for the string class, again, just Google Java, some version number, and then big S string, and that'll take you to the string documentation. Right, I guess it's worth quickly looking at this, uh, if I can. It's gonna let me look at it. So it's a fairly large class, right? So uh, the C standard library, its string uh, library is quite small, right? There's how many, how many functions are there? There might be roughly a dozen or so functions. If you look at the string class, right, I'm just gonna scroll past uh, the top part here, um, and you go to the method summary, uh, you're gonna discover that there's, a, oops, sorry, a lot of methods, right? Scroll through. Right, so quite a few methods, right? No one's, gonna ex no one's expecting you to memorize what all these things do, right? Um, if you're programming in Java though, you have to uh, be familiar with what the uh, basic functionality of the class is, right? So there's things like you can search a string. So you can ask a string, right? Do you contain a substring, right? Oddly enough, you can't ask it if it contains a car. Right, if you want to ask it, does it contain a particular car, uh, you use index of, right? and that returns the index of the car, assuming it's in the string. Right? Uh, you can ask the string, is it empty? Right? You can ask for its length, right there. Right? If you want to search from the back of the string, you can use last index of, right? and so on and so on and so on and so forth. There's also methods here that look like they changed the string. Right? So there's a method here called replace. Right? It looks like it replaces all occurrences of that character in the string with that character in the string. But the string class is funny, it doesn't actually do that. So I'll explain what it does in just a second. Right. So the thing to remember with strings, uh, so one of the big differences compared to C is that you can't change a string once you make one. Right. And C is strings just an array, so you can go in and fiddle with the elements of the array all you want to. Right. In Java, you can't access, you cannot modify the individual characters of the string after it's created. Right, so we say that they are immutable. Uh, one of the reasons why the string class is immutable is because it's easier to make um, a class where the value that the objects represent never change, right, compared to making a class where the values can change. Right? And so uh, in object-oriented programming, you'll often see the terms immutable and mutable. Right? Immutable means objects can't change, right? their state can't change, so the characters of the string can't change. Right. Um, you might think that's weird because a lot of string operations, well, I want to join two strings or I want to remove a character from a string or something like that. Right. If you want or if you need the mutable version of string, there's a separate class that represents a mutable string. Right. I'll show you that in just a second. Right. So you have to remember that when you're using string, anything that looks like it changes the string doesn't actually change the string. What it does is it computes a new string equal to uh, the what you think should be the modified string, right? So for example, there's a two uppercase and a two lowercase method in the string class, right? So if you call it, if you make a string s, or you make a variable s, right? And you store the string, a reference to the string hello in that variable, right? Then when you call two uppercase using s, right? So s dot two uppercase, right? Uh, that gives you the string big H, big E, big L, big L, big O. But it actually gives you a new string equal to that string, right? And it returns that. So you, have, uh, you typically want to remember what the returned value is, right? If you're calling two uppercase, you want the uppercase version of the string. So often you're going to store that in a variable, right? If you print out S and up, not surprisingly, you get little H, E, L, L, O and big H, E, L, L, O. Uh, here, right, I'm gonna, th there's the common error that a lot of uh, new programmers will make. They'll just say t.2 uppercase, t, s, sorry, s.2 uppercase, right? Uh, and they'll think, well, that turns s into uppercase, uh, but it doesn't. So if you run that, right, so that's what s was created as, right? Uh, that's the variable up, right? Oops, sorry. Uh, there we go. That's the variable up, right? And so up is the result of calling two uppercase on s, right? And now if you print out s again, 
right? S is still the lowercase version of hello, right? So you can't modify the characters of the string. You can reassign S to something else, though, right? Uh, so reassignment still works. You expect, right? So S equals goodbye. Right, that works just fine, right? So now you get the string, uh, oops, sorry, goodbye, right? Uh, so you can always reassign a new, uh, uh, you can always reassign a new reference to the variable s, right? The old string hello is still somewhere in memory, right? It's still floating around, well, uh, in this particular case, it's probably still floating around somewhere in memory. There are no more references to the string hello though, right? Uh, to, the, to the original lowercase string hello. So the way the Java language works is that you don't have to get rid of that string yourself, right? So memory management, you don't care about it anymore, right? And so the Java virtual machine is keeping track of all of your objects, right? When it realizes that there are no references to a particular object, right? It decides that it can come along and clean up after that object, right? Exactly when it cleans up is uh, not important, right? It doesn't happen instantaneously. Right, uh, but every once in a while, the, uh, the virtual machine comes along and cleans up any objects that are no longer required. Right, so if you do something like this, right, reassign uh, S to refer to a new string, the old string will eventually get cleared up for you. Okay, so uh, in C, if you were to um, try to do something with a string, you would take the string and pass it to, an, uh, to a function. Right, notice the difference here in Java, right? In Java, you have a variable that stores the string, right? That's S. Typically, what you're gonna do is you're going to uh, ask the object to do something, right? Using this dot notation, right? So rather than two uppercase round brackets S, which is what you'd write in C, right? Most of the time, it's S dot two uppercase, right? Not all of the time, right? So how can you tell which version to use? Right, so the answer is whether or not the method is static. Right, so if you go back to the documentation and you look at two uppercase or two lowercase, it doesn't matter which one, right? When you look at the column in the left-hand side, right, that tells you not only the return type, but it also tells you whatever modifiers are, are on the method, right? So if the method is static, Right? That's when you call the method like it was a C style function. Right? So to call this method here, you would write string dot value of and then pass in something. Right? There's a value of string to some, oh no, there's a value of object. So you would write string dot value of and pass in, for example, another string. Right? And that gives you back the string representation of the string, which is just a string. Right? If the method is not static, so something like trim, for example, Right, now you need a variable to call the method. Right, so here you need a string reference s, right, and you would write s.trim. Right, and so that's how you can tell whether or not you want to call the method as though it were a function, right? In that case, it has to, it's static, right? Uh, otherwise, if it's not static, you're calling it uh, using a variable, uh, so an object reference. Right, so you can conclude right away here, two uppercase, it must be a non-static method because I'm using a variable to call the method. Right, notice that you don't pass in the string as the argument. Right? Uh, this is very odd for C programmers right? because C programmers are used to passing in everything into a function. Right? Um, whereas uh, when you're using an object-oriented programming language, you have to remember that one of the things you would normally pass to the function is instead used to call the method, right? So you require an object reference to call a non-static method, right? If I want to call the two uppercase method, I need a variable that refers to a string. Right? Okay, so string does have static methods as well, right? You always use the name of the class to call the static method, right? Value of is used to convert the primitive types uh, to a, uh, Sorry, it's not used to convert. It gives you the string representation of the primitive type value there, right? So you can always call value of on any of the primitive types, right? And that gives you back the string, uh, the string representation of that value, 
right? So 1.0, 1, uh, true or false, right? Or any of the other numeric types, right? That will give you back the string representation of that value. You typically don't, uh, so you can call value of, um, but it's often easier just to write that, right? So take the empty string, concatenate that with the value, and that effectively does the same thing. All right, so this is another confusing thing in C. Um, so actually, it's not that bad for, sorry, compared to C. Uh, it's not that bad in Java. Uh, sorry, it's not that bad for C programmers because you should know that if you wanted to compare two strings for equality in C, right, you can't just ask if the two arrays are equal, right? So if you have a, an array S and an array T, you can't write S equals equals T in C, right? You would use uh, strcmp, right, in C to compare two strings for equality, right? So what you need to remember in Java is if you ever have two reference type variables and you want to test are those objects equal, right? It's almost always the equals method, right? So if I want to know is the string S, which is hello, right? And this other string S, uh, T, sorry, which is also hello, right? If I want to test if they're equals, right? You want to write S dot equals T. Equals exists for every reference variable, right? So it doesn't matter what the type is. Um, sorry, it doesn't matter what the reference type is. You can always call equals using that reference type of variable. Right? If you want to test if two primitive values are equal, well, now it's equals equals, right? So if I want to test if two ints are equal, it's equals equals, or the two, equals, uh, two equal operators beside each other, right? If you want to test if two doubles are equal, it's equals equals, right? If you want to test if two references are equal, it's dot equals, right? Um, so here, that's going to be true, right? So equality for strings means, are the two, do the two strings have the same sequence of characters? Are they of the same length, right? So this is the string hello. That's also the string hello. I'll explain what this new thing does here in just a second, right? So S equals T will be true. In this particular case, if you ask is S equal to T, it's going to be false. But you have to be super careful here, and I'll show you an example of that in Eclipse in just a second. Right. Uh, all right, so what is this new thing here? Right. So we saw a new with arrays. Right. So if you wanted a new array, you would write new, and then the element type, and then square brackets, and then a number. Right. The new operator uh, is sort of like the malloc operator uh, in C. Right. So in other words, um, it's responsible for allocating memory for, the, uh, for a newly created object. Right? Now, unlike malloc, the way you use new is that you call what's called a constructor. Right? And so every reference type, um, not every reference type, most reference types or most classes have constructors. The name of a constructor is always the same as the name of the class. Right? So the string constructor is just called big S string. Right? And there's a bunch of them. So if we go back to the documentation, uh, near the top of the documentation, you'll see a section called constructor summary, right? And these are the constructors for the class, right? So there's a constructor just called string, has no arguments, right? So it's like a void function. Uh, sorry, it's like a function that has no parameters um, in C, right? So that one tells you it initializes a newly created string object so that it represents an empty string. Right? You can create a string from an array of bytes or from an array of car, like there. Right? You can create a string from another string, like that. Right? You can create a string from something called a string buffer and from something called a string builder. String buffer and string builders, these are the, immu these are the mutable versions of string. Uh, and if I remember, I'll show you that in a minute. Right? And so the constructors, um, they are the uh, things that are called um, when you, uh, sorry, to use new, you must call a constructor. The constructor's job is to, initial, is to initialize the newly created object. Right. So here, right, there's also a constructor that takes in a string. Right. Um, hello again. Right. So the way that you use most reference types or most classes in Java, when you want to make an object, it's always new and then a constructor call. Strings are weird, right? Uh, so because strings are so commonly used, um, the uh, designers of the language decided that 
uh, you often don't, re uh, it would be easier to use the class if we didn't force you to call the constructor and use new, right? So s equals, this also works, right? And so the, uh, the designers of the language decided that we should allow this to happen, right? In other words, we should let string literals exist, right? Um, and so that's why I said it was a bit unusual using string as your first class in Java because it doesn't really behave like other classes, right? Almost no one writes that, right? So almost no one calls a string constructor uh, to create a string from another, from an existing string, right? Because the shortcut exists, right? Uh, so uh, this exists, right? Now, if you do call the constructor though, Right? I guess we should do this example that's in the slides. Uh, so let me do hello here. And let's do uh, s equals. Do I still have an equal? I don't have another hello. Uh, let's do this. Okay, so I'm going to make a string. Uh, so I'm going to set. I'm, I'm going to make a new string, right? Having the characters H E L L O, and store that in S, right? I'm now going to compare S to the string H E L L O, right? Hopefully that should be true, right? So it is true. That's good, right? If you use Oh, sorry. Okay, so if you use equals equals instead to compare the two strings, right? In this particular case, you get false, right? And so this is telling you that, so if you forget that equals equals only works with the primitive types, right? Uh, then this looks confusing, right? Because S is hello, right? The string hello is hello, right? Why doesn't equals equals compare as true, right? To make things even more confusing, oops, sorry. String T, uh, do I have a T yet? No. Okay, so string T equals hello. Okay, so if I make, if I create a new string variable T, right, and also make it be the string hello, if I now compare S and T, if I now compare S and T, S, oh, sorry, not S and T. I'm being a dumb here. String, sorry, equals S. There we go. Right, so if I set T equal to S and compare S and T, right, now the answer is true, right, which is super confusing, right? Uh, and so you, uh, so if you, the reason this is happening is because of what equals equals actually does, right? And so equals equals tests whether or not the two values are equal, right? So this test is S, right? Is its value equal to T? And what you have to remember is in Java, the value of a reference variable is not the object it refers to, right? It's the address of the object that it refers to, right? So for, our, for your purposes, you can think of it as being pointer equality, right? Do two pointers point to the same object? Right? And so this is saying that they do in fact, S and T do in fact point at the same object. Right? That's because of that line right there. Right? So when you use the assignment operator and you assign a reference to a reference, that's like assigning a pointer to a pointer. Right? And so that line that's highlighted says exactly T is a reference to the string that S also refers to. Right? So they both refer to the same string. So equals equals will say they're true, right? Back here, 
right? When you make a new string variable, when you use new, right, that always makes a new string object, right? So here, when I compare s to the string hello, right, that string hello is guaranteed to be a different object than that string that was created using new. Right? New always makes a new object. Right? There's an object there, it's different, it's a different object than that one there. Right? So here when you write s equals equals hello, right, that's when you get false. Right? So strings are super confusing. Right? Um, just remember that if you want to test two strings for equality, Right, always use dot equals. Right. If you want to test any two reference type for equality, right, you almost always want to use uh, dot equals and not equals equals. Right. Equals equals tests do two references refer to the same object. Right. Dot equals tests whether or not two objects have the same state. Right. Oh, uh, go back. Okay. So like in C, a string is just a numbered sequence. Uh, in this case, it's a numbered sequence of characters, right? Each car in the sequence has an inter index starting at zero, right? So CISC124 or CMPE212, right? It would be a string of length seven, right? Each element of the string has its own index, uh, I guess, starting from the left. The number of characters in the string is called its length, right? Uh, so there's a method called length. Now you have to be careful because it's a method, it's not a field like it is with an array, right? So if you had an array, it's dot length and then nothing, right? So arr dot length gives you the length of the array. For a string, it's a method. So you have to write the round brackets after, the, after length, right? So if your string is sysc124, right, then the length of the string uh, stored in course name is course name dot length, right? The empty string has a length of zero. Uh, Java strings, I'm pretty sure if you look at the standard, the Java language standard, it will say that they are not null terminated, right? So they're not the same thing as C style strings. Right? They don't have to be because the string uh, keeps track of the length of the string, right? Each string object keeps track of its own length, right? Uh, which is different than in C because arrays don't keep track of their own length. Right. If you want an element of a string, you must use car at. You can't use the square brackets. Right. So uh, car at is the method that you want to call uh, to get an element of the character. Right. It's always an index between zero and the length of the string minus one. Right. So if you wanted the individual characters of the string printed out on one line, right, you write a little loop. Right, so starting at zero, going up to, but not including the length of the string, right, and then call car at passing in the index uh, inside the loop. Right, and that'll print out C, then on the new line, it'll print I, and then C, and then S, uh, sorry, then S, and then C, and so on and so forth. Right, here's a method that counts the number of times a, spec a specific character appears in a string. Right, so I'd like to know how many times does the character stored in target appear in the string, string S. Right, so you just loop over the elements of the string uh, and compare each element to target. Right, so to loop over the string, so it's always a, uh, sorry, so strings don't have a for each loop, um, which is weird, but that's the way it works in Java. Right, so there's no for each loop in ja uh, for strings in Java, so you always, you always use a counting style loop if you're gonna process the elements of a string. Right, so starting at zero, going up to but not including the length. Right, you're just gonna compare uh, the character at index i to the target character, right? Notice here it's equals equals because the target character is a primitive type, right? It's car. So you're not using dot equals here, right? It's equals equals, right? Every time you find a character that matches the target, add one to the count and then return the count, right? This method works even if the string is empty, right? So if the string that you pass in is the empty string, the loop never runs, and you get zero, right? This loop fails, or this method fails if you pass in null for the string, right? So if you pass in null, which means no object, 
right? Then as soon as you call s dot length, you get a null pointer exception. Right? This is the expected behavior in Java, right? So in Java, it's uh, it's um, generally expected that you aren't passing in null for one of your references, right? If you pass in null for one of your uh, one of your reference parameters, right? The expected thing to happen is that you get an exception, right? So it's not like in C where um, you often check for null, um, right? In this case, it's, this is expected behavior. Uh, if it's not the expected behavior, so if the method is able to account for null objects, the documentation for the method will tell you so, right? So here there's no explicit, it's not normal to explicitly test for null here. Okay, so there's the frequency method. There's an example of using the frequency method. Right? Our method is static, right? So here you have to pass in a string, right? You pass in the string that you want to find, uh, you want to count the number of times a character occurs in, right? And you pass in the character that you're looking for, right? Uh, so here, oh wait, the count is one. You can see here I changed this from sysc124 and then I didn't change the answer over here, right? So this is uh, one, not two, right? The number of times C appears is once. Right, case matters, so lowercase c appears zero times, right? The number two appears twice, so I actually got that right, but I forgot to change that one there. That's a one. Right. Oh, sorry. Okay, so now it's just about, it, now the rest of the lecture is just quickly taking you through some of the common methods in string, right? If you want to test does a string contain another string, just use contains, right? So. Does CMP212 contain CMPE in all uppercase? The answer is true, right? Does it contain lowercase CMPE? The answer is no, so it's false. Does it contain a one? Yes, it does, right? You cannot search for a car, uh, which is a bit odd, right? So you can't, sorry, you can't search for a car using contains, which seems odd, but that's the way the this class was designed, right? So if you wanted to search for the letter C, you instead search for the string C, right? So you can either take the empty string and concatenate that with the car you're searching for, right? Or you could just write double quote, double quote C instead, right? If you want to search for a car, then typically the method that you use is index of, perhaps last index of, right? Index of returns the location of the first location of a character in a string, right? You get back minus one if the character is not in the string, right? So where is the big C? Well, the first big C is at index zero, right? Where is the first big P? Well, it's at index two, right? Uh, where is the uh, first two? It's at index five, four, four, right? And where is the little case Z? It's nowhere, so you get back minus one. Right, last index of searches from the back of the string, right? So for the two, the last occurrence of the two is that one there. And so that one's at index six, right? Otherwise, the other examples are the same. Uh, and equals is the method that you use if you want to test two strings for equality, right? Don't forget that, right? It's very easy to forget, right? Uh, and use equals equals. Um, and the really big problem with strings is, is that equals equals is often returns the answer that you're looking for, right? So it's often true. Uh, it often gives you back the correct value of true or false. Right, um, and it's not until uh, you test it with some other um, specific case that you end up getting uh, the wrong answer, right? So if you use equals here to compare these two, it's obviously false, right? And case matters. So um, if you compare little cmpe to 212 to big cmp212, it's also false, right? And finally, uh, the uh, plus operator is string concatenation, right? So it joins, uh, joins the characters of two strings to create a new string, right? You don't have to worry about the string, does the string have enough space to hold the characters of the joined string like you do in C, right? So if you take uh, James with a space and then Bond with a space and then 007 and join those all together, those two strings are equal, right? And you can concatenate primitive values onto a string Right, so I can concatenate 0, 0, and 7 instead of the string 0, 0, 7, and that works just fine, 
right? But don't forget to re remember the order of the operands is important. Right? So here, right, I want to make ha ha, but I incorrectly take a character and a character and add them together, right? So remember when Java sees that, it's int plus int, and that gives you 201, right? Uh, and then it concatenates the string, right? So that's why you get 201 ha here. Uh, substring lets you get part of a string out of another of an existing string, right? And so uh, you use two in, you use one index if you want to start from the front of the, uh, sorry. If you use one index, that's the starting index of the string, and it goes to the end of the string. If you use two indexes, right? That's the starting index. That's the stopping index plus one, right? So plus one. Right? So substring starting at one starts at the character at index one. So that's the B goes to the end of the string. So that gives you everything through the G. Right? Three, four starts at three, goes up to, but does not include the element at index four. Right? So that gives you the character at index three, which is uh, the D. Right? Five, seven starts at index five, goes up to, but not including the seven. Right? So that gives you the sequence FG. Uh, if you use uh, invalid indexes, you get an exception. So all accesses to the string are checked. Sorry, I just want to quickly, okay. I think this is the last slide. So uh, if you want to compare two strings for dictionary order, right, lexicographical order, right, the method that you use is compare to, uh, which is the same as string strcmp in C if you saw it, right? So if you have two strings, S and T, Right, s dot compared to t, uh, it returns zero if the two strings are equal. Right, s dot compared to t returns some integer that's negative if s comes before t in the dictionary. Right, so do I have an example here? I do. Right, and then s dot compared to t returns an integer value greater than zero if s is after the t in the dictionary order. Right, so negative. Zero, positive, right? Less than, equal to, greater than, right? So compare to is the um, analog of less than, greater than, and equal to uh, for reference types. Right, so you have the strings aardvark and zebra, right? S compared to T, right? So aardvark compared to zebra is some negative value. Aardvark comes before zebra, right? T compared to S is zebra compared to aardvark. Right, so zebra comes after aardvark, so you get back a positive value. Uh, t dot compared to t will give you back zero because zebra is equal to zero. Uh, sorry, zebra is equal to zebra. Okay, I guess we'll stop there because uh, we're basically at 20 after. Um, and we'll quickly finish this off in the next lecture.